you have your Bible with you, and you should, hold it up. Say, this is my Bible. Is my Bible. The Word of God. I believe I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I will be everything that it says I can be. This morning I will be taught out of the Bible. It will go into my heart, renew my mind, change my life. And I boldly declare that when I leave here today, I will not be the same. In Jesus' name, God's people said. Amen. Amen. How many of you have uh, ever had a good friend or a relative that somebody just kept lying about? Anybody? Just kept telling lies about them, not telling the truth, and after a while, you just say, that's enough. Anybody ever experienced that? Oh, Pastor Mike, where are we going this morning? Well, just hang on. We're going to get there. Well, I've about had enough of people lying about my God. And uh, I heard some stuff in the last couple of weeks from religious people. I'm not even going to say they're Christians. That's between them and God whether they are or not, but if they are, they need to notify their mouth of it. Uh, about saying things about my God that's not true. Especially in the area of healing, but I mean in, in, in every area. And we talked in great detail about some of this. I think it was uh, uh, last Sunday and, and uh, no, it wasn't last Sunday. It was the one before that and then the Wednesday night before this last Wednesday night. But I want to, you don't have to turn to these because I'm going to go through this rather quickly, uh, these scriptures. But I, I want to I wanna read you some scriptures. Uh, and I want to get some things straight this morning. Uh, that the body of Christ has been lied to about God. I'm talking about mo most everybody in here has come out of some sort of denominational church. And every denominational church in the beginning, for one thing, it wasn't God's will that there be denominations, but that, that aside, there, there became one because this one competing against this one with his truth and competing against this one and then they start putting that on the the, the front of their building and then the more different names came then the more divided the body of Christ came and you know I'm right and you're wrong and all that kind of stuff and uh, God's you know if you go read through the New Testament there was one church there are a lot of home churches but there was one church and that, that church all taught the same thing there was no division Every one of the churches believed Jesus was Lord. Every one of the churches believed that Holy Ghost had been sent on the day of Pentecost. Every one of the churches spoke in tongues. Amen. And so there wasn't any division in the church. The, the division was in the church and the religious people, uh, the Jews. And, and, the, and the, uh, the hierarchy in the Jews, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and that sort, sort of thing. Uh, and, and so, down through the years, different denominations, and, and each one was established on a truth. You know, the Methodist Church was uh, established on, on a truth. The Baptist Church was established on a truth. The Presbyterian Church was, was established on a truth that, that we've been predestined by God to have certain things. And, and the, the basic line of that truth uh, is in the Bible, but then you go and you start doing all these other things with it, and so uh, the the result of it has been a lot of religious talking, and not much Bible talking, and so the gospel has gotten watered down, and has become ineffective in so many churches. That's why you can't just walk. You ought to go. You ought to be able to go to any church on any Sunday morning, walk in there, and know somebody's going to lay hands on you to get healed. 
You ought to be able to go to any church and walk in there and know that if you need the Holy Ghost, they're going to lay hands on you, pray with you, and you're going to receive the Holy Ghost, speak with other tongues. See, we, we're no better than anybody else, but one of the reasons the Lord had me organize this church was to get out of that religious tradition and to teach what the Bible says about things and then demonstrate it. Demonstrate that Jesus is Lord. But let me read, let me read you some scriptures because the biggest thing other than, uh, well, you know, um, 3 John 2. Who can quote to me what 3 John 2 says? 3 John verse 2. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And the two things that the body of Christ religiously and denominations preach against more than anything else is prosperity and healing. Isn't that amazing? Well, we know he did it, but he don't do it anymore. And I wouldn't want to talk about money because you know that money is a root of all evil. And that's not even what the scripture says. It says the love of it. When you put it first. Amen. So let's just talk about some of these things this morning. And, and uh, I, I hope you get this CD and just play it and play it and play it and play it and, and then give it away or whatever. Matthew 8, 2. And you, like I said, I'm going to fly through these beginning scriptures. A leper came to Jesus, worshipped him, and he said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus, in verse 3, said he touched him and said, I will, and the Bible says he was immediately cleansed. Was it God's will that that man be healed? Okay, Matthew 8, verse 6, a centurion came to Jesus about his servant, and he said he was pleading with Jesus to heal him of the palsy. He said he was tormented, and Jesus said in verse 7, I will, and I I will to come and heal him. And, of course, you know the story. He said, you know, I, I... People do what I say, I honor the word. You just speak the word and he'll be healed. And and he did, and and his centurion, uh, his servant was healed. Mark chapter 1, verse 40, a leper kneeling before Jesus said, if you will, you can make me clean. And in verse 41, Jesus said, what? I will. So was it God's will to heal that man? Yes, it was. Matthew 4, 24, in Syria, It says, all the sick, all those that had diseases, all those that were demon-possessed, all those that were lunatics, that means mental illness, all those that was with palsy or were crippled, he said, they came to him and he healed them all. Healed all of them. So was it God's will to heal then? Yes, it was. Matthew 12, 15, and I can go on and on and on, and I will give you a, a few more. Matthew 12, 15 said great multitudes followed Jesus and he healed them all. Matthew 14, 14, Jesus saw a great multitude and he healed their sick. Matthew 15, 30, great multitudes came to Jesus, the lame, the blind, the dumb, the maimed, and many others, it says, and he healed them. Matthew 19, 2, great multitudes followed Jesus and he healed them there. Matthew 21, 14, the blind and the lame came to Jesus and he healed them. Luke 4, 40, the sick and disease were brought to Jesus and he laid his hands on them and healed them every one. Luke 6, 19, multitudes came and he healed them all. Luke 9, 11, he healed them that had need of healing. See, Jesus healed all who came to him. All of them. His nature was always to heal. Well, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he healed then, and he did, we've given scriptural proof of that, then he'll heal today, and he has. I'm living proof of that. And he'll heal forever because he's the same. He's not going to change. Nothing has passed away. Healing hasn't passed away. God doesn't withhold healing for any reason at all. 
Well, what, you don't, don't you think he wouldn't heal them if, if, so, if a sinner came in here because of his sin? Wouldn't his sin stand in the way of God healing? Everybody that came to Jesus was a sinner. There was no redemption yet. Every single person that came to Jesus and he laid his hands on was a sinner. Amen. He's the healer, deliverer, and never the destroyer. Say with me, Jesus is never the destroyer. Father, as we come before you this morning, help eyes to see, hearts to receive the goodness and your heart for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 9, 56, Jesus said, For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, As someone once said, what is it that you don't understand about Jesus didn't come to destroy your life? I mean, Christians tell me that. Oh, God just destroyed my life. I don't know what I did wrong. I'm sure it's just probably a test. That testing thing has been just absolutely so misused and overused. Said so Jesus said, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And the word save includes healing, deliverance, rescued from death. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus came that whatever is going on in your life, he has come that you might have it better than when he came before he came. However good your life is now, Jesus' desire and Jesus' will is that it be better than it is right now. If you're a millionaire right now, he wants you to have two. <coughs> if you're in poverty, he wants you to have plenty. Amen. That's always his will. That is his way. That is his word. Someone might say, but yeah, that, that was when Jesus was alive here in the earth. Okay. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 tells us, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, talking about Jesus, likewise shared in the same. Well, what does that mean? That means, you know, people in the earth were flesh and blood. Well, Jesus came to the earth and he was flesh and blood, just like them. He himself likewise shared in the same, that through death, his death, he might destroy him who had. What tense is had? who had the power of death. That is the devil, for those that are slow. Him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Well, did Jesus come? Did Jesus die? Was he raised from the dead? Then the devil has been robbed, taken away of the power over death. Listen to me closely. I'm fixing to shoot a religious cow. The devil does not have the power to kill you. He doesn't have the power to, to take your life through disease. Yet Christians give him all this power.
Turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 2. I'm telling you something this morning that will save your life or kill you, depending on how you receive this. That's how serious this is. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, reading in the Amplified, the Expanded Translation. And you who were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, your sensuality, your sinful carnal nature, well, I can testify that was me. God brought to life together with Christ. Amen. How did he do that? By your choice to receive him for what he did and what the Bible says he did. Having freely forgiven us all our transgressions. Did you see that? Freely, freely forgiven us. Having canceled, blotted out, Wiped away the handwriting of the note, the bond with its legal decrees and demands which was in force and stood against us, hostile to us. This note with its regulations, decrees, and demands, he set aside and cleared completely out of our way. By nailing it to his cross. All right, let's float there a minute. I know what the Bible says under the old covenant about the sins of the father being passed down to the generations. That's been wiped out right there. Well, my grandma died with cancer and you know, I think I look just like her. I got her genes. I'm probably going to die with cancer too. Talking like that, you probably will. But your grandma has not got anything to do with cancer in your body. If you're a believer, that has been cut off at the cross. There are no more sins of the fathers that have a right to come into your life, your children's life, and there are churches that will fight all day long, take swings at me for saying something like that. They do too. You know what the Bible, I know what the Bible says, and I just read it to you right here. He said all that has been completely cleared out of our way by nailing it to his cross. Get this. Verse 15. Just to amplify this, God disarmed principalities and powers that were ranged against us and made a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in Him and in it, the cross. But people want to discount the cross. People say God doesn't heal anymore. Or people say, the curse has come upon you from your great-granddaddy or whatever. And people religiously believe that. I mean, they'll, they'll absolutely fight you over it. But they haven't read their Bible. The Bible doesn't say that. In fact, the Bible completely and very clearly refutes that. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Does everybody understand so far what I just read there in that verse? Jesus was in here with a purpose. Well, what was Jesus' purpose in the earth? It tells you right here. Read your Bible. See, a lot of people are not reading their Bible. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy 
the works of the devil. That's the only thing that Jesus or God ever destroyed. He's not the destroyer. Amen. Pastor Mike, you just sound like you're hostile about this. I'm very hostile about it. I'm tired of seeing people die that don't have to die. And I'm tired of hearing my father and my Jesus being misrepresented by people that if they just read their Bible should know better. These are religious people. These are religious leaders. These are pastors and evangelists and, and, and television people that get on there and put this garbage out there and people just, just suck it in and then get mad at God and walk away from the faith because they died because they said well, what they said didn't work. I'm telling you something this morning that works. Every single time. Every time. He was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, the word works there is undertakings, the business of the devil, the acts of the devil, the deeds of the devil, the products of the devil. Anything that kills the devil. Anything that steals the devil. Anything that destroys the devil. I don't know how to make this any more clear. But yet people will argue with you about it. And all I'm doing is reading what the Bible says about it. Revelation eleven eighteen tells us this. It says that nations and the dead who rejected Jesus will be judged and destroyed. Why? Because their choice of rejecting wasn't God. But it says God's servants, his prophets and saints, will receive rewards. Those who revere and respect his name. Okay. How many in here have rejected Jesus? No hands for those who are listening to the CD. How many of you have received Jesus and revere and respect his name. Every hand. You are a representative of others in the body of Christ this morning. I'm planting you as a seed. To go and tell people. God is not mad at them. God is not hold, holding aught against them. The only thing that God has for you. If you have acknowledge Jesus if you've received him as your Lord and Savior is rewards blessing oh but Pastor Mike what about that judgment seat in heaven oh there's a judgment seat there's two of them there's one for those that rejected Jesus and the reason they'll be destroyed is they will be joining their father the devil in the lake of fire but you'll skip that room you're going to go on down the hall to the crown room. And the judgment that God will place on you is how many crowns you get. You're going to get at least one. <laughs> You're going to get at least one. Very likely many, many more. Amen. In your new mansion, you're going to have to have a whole wing with rooms displaying your crowns and rewards. Hallelujah. Are you with me so far? Okay. Christians have got to learn the character, the integrity, and the nature of God. And stop misunderstanding His sovereignty. Boy, His sovereignty has been blamed for so much. Well, you know, that, that storm did come. God caused it. No, he did not. Yes, he did, because you know God is sovereign. Yeah, God's sovereign, but you don't understand what sovereign means. You need to do a biblical study of the word sovereign hooked in with your God. 
And so they think that God is responsible for everything or most things bad that happens. These are things that I've heard. God put them in that accident at that red light so he, they'd be in the hospital, be laid up so that they couldn't do all the things and, and, and flit here and there and there and, and they'd be laying in that hospital bed so they can lay there and be still and listen to God. They're not going to listen to God. They're going to watch as the world turns on TV or some basketball game. They're not going to be in that hospital to listen to God. God can get your attention without putting you into an accident, believe me. Well, you know, Katrina came to New Orleans by a sovereign act of God because there's so much sin there. Well, I was raised in New Orleans, and he's right. There is sin there. But if God sent Katrina to New Orleans, he's no respecter of persons. He'd have to wipe out the whole world because the whole world's full of sin. Why would he pick on little old New Orleans? You know why? Because God didn't have anything to do with Katrina. God doesn't have anything to do with hurricanes. God doesn't have anything to do with earthquakes. God didn't have, oh, God sent an earthquake on that country. Because, no, God didn't send an earthquake. The, the Bible says that the world rocks and reels under the weight of sin. And, and it's shifting. That's where the damage is coming from. That's where the destruction is coming from. Amen. It's not coming from God. God hasn't got anything to do with any of that. My, my, my. Well, he took Aunt Gertrude. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. She was 95. He took her. Really? Well, he must be a liar. Because he said, if you want to, you could live to 120. Now, there's a reason Gertrude went. I hope that's not your Aunt Gertrude, but I had, a, I had an Aunt Gertrude. He didn't take my Aunt Gertrude. Bless God, she decided to leave. She went one, to bed one night and checked out. That's what she did. Good Baptist woman. Preached to you in a drop of a hat. Drove too fast, but. Well, you know, for all the things that I've been involved in and so forth, God wanted to get my attention, so he had me fired off my job. I've heard these things. Some of you have heard these things. Fired off your job. God got you fired off your job. And that's the job you said God gave you. Now he's changed his mind, and he gets you fired off of it. What's causing all this? Just hang with me. I'm going to tell you. I know exactly what's causing all this. I'm ahead of you, Pastor Mike. It's the devil. No, it isn't. What? Nope. Hang with me. Don't get ahead of me. Let me tell you about God's nature. And I'm not telling most of you things that you haven't already heard. I, I almost feel like I'm preaching to the choir. But sometimes I find out by hearing individual conversations, I'm actually not. So we need to get some things clear today. In 1 John 1, 5, the Bible says God is light. And it also says that there is no darkness in him at all. So anything having to do with darkness, which is sin, degradation, all that kind of stuff, that's darkness. God's not in that because he's light. In fact, the Bible actually says he is absolute light, no darkness. It also says in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. He's absolute love, which means there no, there's no hatred in him. Now, the Bible translated says there's six, yea, seven things that God hates. If you look up that word hate, it doesn't mean hate in the sense that we use the word hate. It means there's seven things that God hates. Seven things that God will have nothing to do with. When you see that word hate hooked with God, 
if you'll study it out, it means there are things that God will have nothing to do with if it says hate, because God is love. And there isn't any qualification that would change any of that. God is love. He is love. He is love. He's love. He's not hate. Has nothing to do with hate. And then, the third part of his nature is that he is life. John eleven twenty five, 25, John 14, 6. He is absolute life, which means in God there is no death. So he can't give you cancer. He doesn't have it. Huh? He can't give you the flu because he's not sick. He can't give you a depraved mind because he's not depraved. God can only give you what he has. And all he has is good and perfect gifts. That's all he's got. Well, why do good Christians and even children die, Pastor Mike? Choices. In fact, I've titled this this morning, It's Your Choice, God Already Made His. Choices. The Bible says, cast your care upon the Lord. But most Christians stay stressed out all the time. They come and tell me, oh, I'm just so stressed out, Pastor Mike. I need for you to pray for me. Why are you stressed out? Stress is an open door to disease and sickness. I mean, the devil will be over in the corner. I didn't do it. Wish I had, but I didn't do that. Why are you accusing me? Because you're the devil and I'm going to accuse you anyway. But the truth of it is, he really didn't have anything to do with it in that immediate sense. Now, he did in the general overall scheme of things. But he didn't put it on you. You opened yourself up to it. People wonder why things happen to them. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Christians just mouthing off all the time. Blah, 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 blah. What, what won't work, what can't work. I don't know why this don't work. I don't know why this did. You know, I had my car from sale. I've had my car for sale for three months, and I do not know why it has not sold. Well, you just told me why it has not sold. You just said it has not sold. You need to be talking about how the perfect buyer with great credit or plenty of cash is on his way to buy your car or your house. Or whatever. But every time you say something other than that, you open a door for what you don't want to come in because of your choice. I got up early to come to church this morning. I do not like having to sit here and listen to this. Well, I'm not sorry. I'm trying to tell you how to sell your car, <laughs> how to keep from getting sick, and how to quit blaming God for your problems because it's taking you down a road that you don't want to go down. And you don't even understand why if this is talking about you. And to some extent, it's probably talking about all of us. But James 3, 6 says that when we say things, that it sets into motion the course of nature in your life. When you speak, there's a course that is set. Your words are powerful. Other than the love of God, it's the most, words are the most powerful thing in the universe that exists. Your words. And when you speak, it sets in the spirit and the natural realm, the course of nature to bring what you have spoken 
into a place and configured that you will walk in it. You are snared by the words of your mouth. What are you stepping in? You're stepping in what you have said. Makes a path. It's true. The Bible says to forgive. But there are Christians that carries, they carry grudges and oughts for years and years. There are Christians in this church, in this church, that want to sit over here on this side of the church, want to sit over there on that side of the church because they want to be as far away from each other as they can get because they got out against each other, unforgiveness. In this church, it's got to stop. It's got to stop. That's amazing. I preached my heart out for 40-something years. It's, it's some, somewhere along the line, they ought to catch on to that. And then they come to me and say, I don't know why blah, blah, blah is happening. I don't know why blah, blah, blah. Well, then if you tell them, they get mad and won't come to church for a while. And I've made it worse for them. Now they got out against me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you preach on 1 Corinthians 13 8 and tell what love is and Christians throw up their hands and say, well I've had it because I can't live that I can, there's no way I can do that no there's no way you can do that because you just said you cannot do that so you're going to live in the misery of the opposite of it Stop it. Stop it. 1 John 3.23 We're giving one commandment that's two parts. Believe on the name of Jesus. Believe what is on the name of Jesus. That's the anointing of God to destroy yokes and remove burdens. And love one another. Love one another. There are people, I love everybody. Now there's some people I love from a distance. But I can truthfully stand up here and say, I don't hate anybody. I love everybody. I can't hang with some people. And the most, mostly the reason I can't hang with them is because of their mouth. And I cannot expose myself to constant negative, pff, trashy talk. Love them. Can't hang with them. <laughs> See, these are all choices and every choice you make has a consequence. You know that in the natural world. Talk about your boss long enough, you're going to get fired, darling. You think it's not going to get back to him or her? The very one you're talking to can't wait to go and tell him because he wants your position. Humans are mean. <laughs> we heard recently, and, and I had somebody come and ask me about this and couldn't understand why God took that little three-year-old girl that was found wandering down the road, got hit by a truck, not too long ago was in the news. Why did God take her? Why did her parents let her out? There I said it. <laughs> Wasn't God's fault. Parents strung out on drugs, fighting with each other, trying to kill each other, and a little girl gets out. She's scared. She's running away. She goes down the road. Nobody can see her. That man ran over and killed her. The man did not kill her. Her parents killed her. The man was driving legally down the highway. Horrible, horrible thing. Choices. Choices. Human choices. Bad choices. Jesus came 
that we might have life and life abundantly. The devil came to kill, steal, and destroy. Well, why did this happen? Why, why did that happen? Why did this happen? There's all kinds of reasons why things happen. And I don't know the, the, the cause and the reasons for all things that happen that are bad. But one thing I do know, and I know it very clearly, it isn't God. He didn't have anything to do with it. And there are people sitting in their house right now that won't attend church because they're mad at God for doing this, taking that one, causing this one. And he's not even at fault. Wasn't anywhere near. Pastor, why did daddy die of cancer? He was a believer. He was a strong person in the church. We prayed for him. He was believing God for healing. Well, we had a situation like that in their church years ago, a number of years back. And a wonderful, wonderful guy in our church. Their family went here and so forth. Part of the church. And uh, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. I would go to the doctor with him and get the the consultation that he was having about getting on the chemotherapy and all the stuff that they decided to do. Strong believer. Stood in faith. Boy, I mean, nothing, nothing it seemed came out of his mouth but faith. So he was he had been a heavy smoker. And so I, I went to their house one day. I was doing visitations and I was right near there and and he was bedridden by this time and uh, still believe in God, boy. He's, I'm the healer of the Lord. You walking in, how you doing this morning? I'm the healer of the Lord. Healer of the Lord. Yet he was continuing to do the very thing that was killing him. I don't know. Maybe I look really dumb, but I know what cigarette smoke smells like with Lysol sprayed on top of it. I just do. It's like <laughs> I've known people that said they quit drinking, and boy, I'd smell it. And I, I one person I brought it up to him one time. I said, "Why are you still drinking?" I'm not drinking. I said, "Well, I smell vodka," and they said, "Vodka doesn't have an odor." <laughs> I, said, I beg to differ with you, partner, but vodka has an odor. <laughs> What does it smell like? Vodka. They believe this stuff. They can continue to drink that. And because they're not drinking something that has an odor to it, that it's not killing them as much as the other stuff that did have an odor. I'm just a stupid bastard. I don't know nothing. I got a nose. Yes, he was confessing that he was healed of the Lord, but he was continuing to smoke like a smokestack. God was not withholding healing from him. He was doing his best to honor his confession. But he was what I call behind the power curve. He had already, he had already headed in there and there wasn't anything God could do about it. God can make him stop smoking. No, he cannot make him stop smoking. Well, I'll tell you what. God will just make the smell of that alcohol, the taste of that alcohol, so horrible that when he drinks it, he just won't want any more of it. That's a lie from the pit of hell that people have been told too. That is not true. That is a lying testimony. God did not make you sick from drinking the alcohol. You probably got sick from drinking the alcohol because your body was rejecting it because it was probably getting cirrhosis of the liver and you got sick from it because your liver wasn't processing it anymore. That's what made you sick. And then you got smart enough to quit drinking and say, oh, thank you, God, for making me sick. God didn't make you sick. Now, we're laughing, but you know good and well I'm telling the truth. You've heard all this stuff, and it's out there, and this is the kind of thing that makes Christians make wrong choices because they hear this stuff from people they highly respect in the faith. 
but they're lying to you because they've been lied to. So don't put them down. They've been lied to. They actually believe it. <sighs> See, God's not responsible for anyone dying, ever. I'm going to say it again. God is not responsible for anyone ever dying, ever. And God didn't take them to heaven. Now, I, 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 what kicked me into this mode was I watched Evangelist Billy Graham's funeral. Beautiful funeral. I loved him. He's responsible for me getting saved. That's a long testimony, but he is. But they kept getting up there. I don't know why God took him. I don't know. It was God took him. And I just said, oh. And they teach that stuff, and the people, amen, amen, you know, and they had about 2,000 people there. Everybody got up there. I don't know why God took him. Well, finally God took him. Finally God took him. God did not take evangelist Billy Graham. Pastor, you can lose your ordination talking like that. You talking about Billy Graham. No, uh, God didn't take Billy Graham to heaven. Woo, you said it again. I'm buying a CD. The only people that I have found in the Bible, and I must apologize for this if it offends you, but I'm really not apologizing. I was just saying that to be nice. Uh, if God takes somebody, it's going to be in the Bible. Then you have a right to believe it. Amen. In the Bible, the inerrant word of God, it's, it's the truth. It is the standard. So I looked it up. I didn't go into great detail. I'm sure there are others, but uh, or maybe, I don't know if, it, if there are, but I, just, just on the top of my head, the only people, and God did take some people to heaven. He took Elijah, but he was still alive. He took Enoch, you know what? He was still alive. He took Jesus to heaven, he was still alive. And the Bible says he's going to take us. And if he comes pretty quickly, we'll all still be alive. <laughs> now I'm real confused, Pastor Mike. What happened to Evangelist Billy Graham if God didn't take him? Did that mean he didn't go to heaven? No, God received him. Evangelist Graham decided it was time to go. He had finished the course. He had fought the good fight of faith. Amen. He had done what he was here to do. And he left. He just left. They said he went quietly in his sleep. He just left. God received him. Yes, he very much is in heaven. Absolutely. God didn't take him. He received him. Well, now you're playing with words. No, I'm not playing. I'm very serious this morning. There's a difference. They're even spelled differently. He received him. He'll receive you. See, uh, you and your position that you're in right now is a result of what you said at some point in your life or what you did or a decision that you made. But God's not responsible. If you're in a position that you don't like, he didn't put you there. You did. Well, see, the good side of that, since you put yourself in that position, you can put yourself in another position. Uh, you have the word of God here to do it. So God's not responsible for anything that kills, steals, or destroys. And another big one. God is not punishing you for something that you've done in the past. I don't know how many Christians have come to me just destroyed. I did this. I 
after I was born again, and I, I, I knew not to do this, and it was wrong, but the pressure and the la 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 and I, I, I just seem, I can't keep a job, I can't keep relationships. Why? I, well, why is God continuing to punish me? I thought he forgave me. Why is he just continuing to punish me over and over? When is he going to let me go and let me have peace? When you decide to have peace. And when you get hold of the truth that God is not punishing you. This is a big one in a lot of Christians' lives. They blame God for the lack of their success and the lack of their deliverance that he is punishing them for something that they did back here that was wrong. And I'll ask them, well, did you know it was wrong? Well, yeah. Did you go to the Lord? Yeah. Did you ask him to forgive you? Yes. (coughs) Well, did he? I don't know. He forgave you on the cross. He forgave you on the cross. Well, let's talk about that a minute. Because the teaching of grace that came out oh, around 2008, 2009 got severely raped in its message. Yes, we have grace. God's ability to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And yes, because of the grace of God, we were forgiven for past, present, and future sins. But when you sin, that doesn't mean you don't have to go to Him. You still got to get it right before Him and you. What, for Christ's sake? No, for your sake. For your sake. The Bible doesn't say anything about even though He has forgiven you for past, present, and future sins, that you can forget about it and just go and do whatever you want to do. And see, this is, this is a denominational doctrine that uh, has been taught through, well, I'm, I'm not going to name the denomination. Most of you know what it is, but that once saved, always saved, which me, and, and, and the truth of that is once saved is always saved. That is true. But what they go along with the doctrine is, I can sin, I can drink, I can rape, I can fornicate, I can adulterate, I can do any of that, and I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and it doesn't matter. Listen, don't frustrate the grace of God. You cannot do all those things. John was talking to believers in Revelation and he said, the people that do this, 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 and illicit will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you think just because you were saved by grace and you want to live your life like the devil, that you're going to go to heaven anyway, I can tell you right now you're not. And here's the reason I'm going to tell you you're not. I'm not judging you because I don't know your name, whoever this applies to. If you're still doing that stuff, you're probably not saved. Because when you get saved, you change. And I'm not talking about that you're not going to mess up. You're going to mess up somewhere along the line. But you go to the Lord and you get it taken care of. You go to Him. The Bible says over there in John, don't sin, comma, but when you do, you still got to go to God and get it right for you. And if you've involved somebody else in in it, you've got to go ask for their forgiveness as well and get it right and reconcile with them. Grace doesn't mean you can just live any way you want to. This doesn't mean that. Yeah, there are people. There's a doctrine. I tell you, there's a thing I put on my Facebook page this week. And I hope all of you go over there and read it. I know a lot of you read it and wouldn't dare admit that you do. But, <laughs> oh, I get radical on there. I do get radical because it is a, it is a voice that the world needs to hear. And I, as long as they, I'm surprised they still print my stuff, but they, they, they hadn't taken me off there yet. No, I don't cuss. Who, said, who was thinking that? I don't say, 
No, it's good stuff I put on there, but it's stuff that people need to hear that most people won't have guts enough, especially men and women of God don't have nerve enough to go out there and say because they're afraid that they'll offend somebody and, and they won't like them anymore. And that's just not true. But I put a thing on there. I, I was reading, I think it was the, I think it's March 8th of uh, Gems 2 by Rick Renner. And he's talking about the spirit of uh, the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans, you know, uh, the ones that come up with all this end time squirrely doctrine that you can do whatever you want to. And anyway, it's about three or four pages. And I, I took a picture of those pages and I put them on my Facebook page. And if you don't have a Gems 2, I challenge you to go read that and it will tell you exactly what is happening in the body of Christ now. And it's coming in through seeker-friendly, totally tolerating whatever. It doesn't, you know, it's good that you're a Christian, but you know there are many expressions of getting to God. That's a lie. Jesus said there's only one way to God. That's through him. Only one way. Or we know that you're a lesbian and a homosexual, but we must tolerate you. No, we mustn't. It doesn't say that we don't love them, but it says speak the truth in love. We are to address it. We are not to tolerate it. We are not to permit it. There will, no, there will never be anybody in leadership in this church or any position of leadership or influencing other people that I'm aware of that are in those kinds of sins or adultery or fornication. And if they are and I find out about it, oh, you're cut out right then. You can, sit in the, you can sit in the chairs. You can get restored, never reject you, never kick you out. I've only had to do that one time in the history of this church in 30 years. Because somebody just refused to acknowledge my authority and acknowledge the authority of God's word and I had to publicly excommunicate him from this fellowship. And I hated it. And I lost four families because of it. But then I got other families that replaced them. You cannot tolerate sin. That's the spirit of Nicolai is it Nicolation? Nicolation? People want to say Nickelodeon. <laughs> I think they're different. <laughs> My kids watch Nickelodeon. <laughs> I watch Nickelodeon. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but I challenge you to go read that or, or grab somebody's gems too and read it out of there. Uh, but it was such a wonderful article. And boy, it lays it out there. Why do you want me to read it? So you don't get guilty of it. So you're not pulled off into it. I'm not telling you that we should be hard. I'm telling you that you should be holy, sanctified, consecrated unto God. And you're not to tolerate these other things that in these end days, there are going to be all kinds of doctrines that come out. several of which I'd like to talk about, but I don't have time to talk about them now. You'll probably hear about it sooner or later. But God's not responsible for all this stuff. And uh, I've had people say, well, why am I always broke? I tithe and give offerings as often as I can. Well, you just told me. If you're bringing tithes and offerings as often as you can, you're not tithing and you're not bringing offerings. Tithe means you tithe on your income. It's what you do. Well, I breathe in and out as often as I can. I don't think you, you breathe in and out all the time, don't you? Well, that ought to be just a part of what you do. See, if you, if you, if you tithe off of one paycheck, not the rest of them, you're not tithing. You're still in the area of offerings. It's an offering. It's not a tithe. Well, now, Pastor Mike, we've been delivered from the curse of the law. Absolutely. We absolutely have. We absolutely have. 
we're not held under a curse. You're, if you don't tithe, God is not putting a curse on God, 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 God is not putting a curse on you. But let me tell you something, my brothers and sisters, the curse is still out there. Curse hadn't disappeared. The curse is still out in the world. Just go out on Saturday night to any of your bar. Don't go there. I'm just saying, if you were to go out to the bars, I'm telling you, don't go there. But you'll see the curse is still out there. Bad analogy, Pastor Mike. And if you get out from under the umbrella of protection, the curse will come on you. That's why a lot of Christians are cursed. God didn't do it. He made provision for us to be free from that. But He also will not hold you by the shirt tail and keep you from going out under it if that's what you choose to do. It's your choice. See, God's already made His. He's made provision. But you can live under a curse if that's what you choose to do. I've even had people argue with me about uh, you know, the, the generational curse. Well, I am too under the generational curse. And I said, well, you know, you surely are. If that's what you're saying. Because you opened up that thing to come into your life by your choice to believe that. So you've got to really watch what you say. So, in between your decision to hold off the devourer by bringing your tithes and offerings, and I'm not trying to scare people into bringing tithes and offerings. You, you folks are the givingest people I've ever experienced in my life. It has nothing to do with that. Y'all are givers, and you're blessed for it. But I'm just, I'm just making this statement because it has to go along with it. It's part of the provision of our redemption. In between your decision to hold off, the devourer didn't get rebuked. And you got out there in that area. But it's not God's fault. One more. I declare in the name of Jesus that I will live to be 120. God promised. Well, not really. He said it would that you do that. You can live to be 120. He has said the length of man is 120. Do you know on God's part that was a statement of faith? But not if you're continuously 60 pounds overweight. You smoke like a railroad train. You drink like a sieve. You never exercise. You eat junk all the time. You never get enough sleep. You're always stressed out. You live in fear. But every one of those, your life is shortened. But it's not God's fault that your life is shortened. You'll live to the extent that you take care of yourself. It's your choice. Look at somebody and say, it's your choice. <laughs> I didn't think that would be too strong. <laughs> Some of you think it's hard to get it out. Listen to Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. <clears throat> God told Moses, He said, I call in the heaven, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. Now that's kind of that'll get your attention. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore, choice, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live. See, that right there kills the curse, and that's the Old Testament. That right there kills that curse of lineage right there. Then in verse 20, which nobody ever reads, 
Because at the end of that verse, there in 19, is a semicolon, which means I'm not finished yet. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice. The longer you live, the longer you've obeyed his voice. And his voice gives you very simple instructions, but it gives you instructions. He tells you how to take care of your body. You mean in the New Testament? <laughs> yeah. Just go read it. It's in there. Um, <laughs> and he says that you may cling to him. For he is your life and he is the length of your days. There it is right there. So I'm not making an opening for you to continue to not take care of yourself like you should. But there are many Christians that are living unto ripe old years, not because they really took care of themselves, but because they cling to Jesus and they look to him and they're doing the best that they know to do and they live a long time. It's like this old gentleman gave a testimony. He was 105 years old and they said, <laughs> what's the secret of your long life? And he said, well, I love God with all my heart and I eat bacon every morning. If he hadn't put that love God with all his heart, I don't think I don't think he'd be there under five eating bacon every morning. <laughs> Miss Hannah can tell you that. <laughs> I asked I, mean, I asked Miss Hannah one time. I said, "What all do you eat?" And she told me what she eats. I said, "I won't hear that." <laughs> she eats right, <laughs> and she's. What? 99. Praise God. 99 years old. Well, he says, so that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. So, I was talking to somebody about that one time and they said, well, haven't you read over there uh, that scientifically our bodies regenerate our, all the cells in our body every seven years? I said, yeah. Well, that doesn't make sense because if your body is regenerated every se seven years, we should just live forever. I said, yeah, that's the way God designed it. But I said, what, cell, what kind of cells in your body are you regenerating? Healthy cells or sick cells? The more sick cells you regenerate, <laughs> you're not making any headway. You're losing, you're losing time. So you can live as long as you want to if you don't do those things that shorten your life. I want to live as long as I can. But there's a, there's a possibility that I won't live as long as I could because there's just certain things I love to eat. <laughs> if I had to give up chocolate, come Lord Jesus, <laughs> you know, pray for me. I am attempting hard to get the extra weight off. And at my age, I have found out it's not as easy as it used to be. So, um, you might be asking this morning, Pastor, what is this, a health sermon? Well, no, not really. It's about not putting sickness and disease and death and accidents and so forth off on God. Understanding that he is the life giver. And because you don't receive answers to your prayers, um, don't blame God for it. In fact, just let's just do one last scripture. 1 John 5, verse 14. 
If you listen in the pastor's prayer time this week, you'll hear this verse every morning. Verse 14 and 15 in 1 John 5, And this is the confidence, the assurance, the privilege of boldness which we have in him. We are sure that if we ask anything, make any request according to his will, in agreement with his own plan, well, that's his word. He listens to us and he hears us. See, when you're praying the word, God hears you. He's listening when you're praying the word. And if since we positively know that he's listened to us and whatever we ask, we also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted us as our present possessions the request made of him. So if your requests aren't being answered, check the scriptural validity of them. And if the scriptural validity is right, check your mouth. And if your mouth is right, and the scriptures are right, and you haven't seen the manifestation yet, stand. Brother Hagen said one time, if you make your mind up that you're going to stand regardless of how long it takes, you're not going to be standing long. That's called faith. Be fully persuaded that God is able to do what he said he would do. and He'll do it. Folks, it's not God. God is not our problem. It's our choice. He's already made his. Life. Life abundant. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Long life upon the earth. He's opened the door for us. But he's given us some simple instructions on how to um, get to all those places. And I know we're not going to be perfect. But see, this can end on a good note because you might be sitting there saying, I'm not perfect. Pastor Mike, and I don't want it to be my confession, but I know I'm not perfect, and there are just certain things that I just have a real problem getting a handle on. Okay. Grace. You hear me? Grace. What we can't do on our own, God has promise that he will come in and carry us through where our inadequacies take us and we can't go any further he will come in if you'll trust him and his grace his ability to do what we can't do for ourselves will uphold you and he will actually carry you through much further than you would have gone before much further that you could go on your own much further than you would ever think you could get because we know we're not perfect. We know we have inadequacies. We know that there's just things that we could just put a list on if we, that we could do better, but somehow or other, we don't, we can't. We're struggling through different things. Call on His grace. That's not to forget and just say, well, you know, it doesn't matter. No, you know it matters. But do the best you can and then expect him to do what he said. He's, he's just standing there waiting to fill in where we can't go ourselves. He's promised you a victory platform. And his grace will get you there. So don't let the devil condemn you because there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Walk after the Spirit. And that's what we're doing. We're learning, we're trusting the Lord, and he will get you to where you need to be. Just trust him. Amen. Find out about his nature. It's always good. If it's not good, it's not God. Amen. Can you receive that this morning? Hallelujah. Well, let's stand up.